in a sense, if we were the, the kind of the little church group, the congregation was the listeners. Right. And that's who, uh, in Air Force, from radio and television later, we always uh, held sacrosanct. Is the only reason we're really doing this is for the listeners or, and later the viewers. Uh, we're not we're not doing it for ourselves. We're not making comedy that amuses us. It does amuse us, but that's not why we're making it. We're making it because it amuses other people. You're listening to another episode of Faith Deficit, a weekly program that explores individual stories of faith in an increasingly secular world. So my guest this week is Don Ferguson. Don is an original member of the Royal Canadian Air Force. It was a weekly comedy show on CBC Radio and TV that ran for 35 years and which still does a very popular New Year's special. Uh, He's written and directed documentary films for CBC Television, created and co-wrote the radio fantasy adventure series Johnny Chase, Secret Agent of Space. He's written for the stage. He's created and produced the comedy series Sketchcom. Um, as a writer and performer, he's won 13 Actor Awards, two People's Choice Awards, a Gemini, a Juno, Governor General's Performing Arts Award. He's been inducted into Canada's Comedy Hall of Fame in Montreal and Canada's Walk of Fame in this Toronto. This guy sounds fantastic. I'd, I'd love to meet <laughs> yeah, him sometime. I mean, <laughs> right. I'm just trying to get through this intro. Anyway, he's done a ton of stuff. You have Don Ferguson Productions. Yes. <laughs> um, and you're working on a bunch of shows. Why Horror, Newborn Moms, My Kitchen Can Be Anything, Second Gen, uh, and probably other stuff in development, oh, yeah. right? Always something in development. It's the, uh, it's the, the, you know, this is, <laughs> this is not a business for people who don't believe. <laughs> you, right. <laughs> you, you have to have, you have to have faith in the future, hope that things will work out. And when you're broke, uh, you, know, you live on the charity of your parents. So That's right. <laughs> we, we've got it. We, we've got the three of them covered. Well, thank you so much, Don. I, I really appreciate it. I know you're super busy, but um, I'm, I've, I've had some really good, you know, powerful conversations with people through this. And I, I'm sure you have. Yes. Because people don't often get a chance. They don't get asked a lot of these questions. They don't get these. The, the, so they, like a lot of people, uh, myself included, it's like, Oh, that's a nice question. I'll be happy to answer that to think about, <laughs> you know, think about one's future, one's faith. Uh, yeah. 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 I've heard, I've heard that from a few people. And it's also interesting because just to hear from you, because you know, in a way, you've been in my life my whole life. I mean, in an, you know what I mean? Like, right. yeah, between yeah. you and Roger and my mom. And yeah, it's cool to hear your philosophy. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you grew up um, and if you sort of grew up in a faith based system and what that was sort of like for you. Okay. I grew up, yeah, in a definitely in a faith based system. So, I grew up in Montreal, Quebec, and Quebec was a very, very Catholic. Uh, it was, you know, f- from top to bottom, it was Catholic. It, it permeated every aspect of society. Uh, religious leaders had incredible moral authority <clears throat> and uh, were not uh, hesitant at all to uh, express it. They were also very much in, uh, connected to what was the, 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 the Quebec government at the time, which was run by the Union Nationale. That was the party of Maurice Duplessis. Uh, and mm-hmm. he was a conservative uh, by nature, and uh, and of course the church hierarchy in Quebec was extremely conservative by nature, as is the the Catholic Church even to this day. You know, the they it's a it's a very conservative organization. Um, and you know, when you when you drove around Quebec, uh, uh, the, the the on the best piece of land in every town, the best piece of land, the tallest and most beautiful building was a church building, either the church itself or something that the church, uh, part of its institutional structure that it used to operate, uh, its vast network of influence in the province. And in Montreal itself, all of the best buildings were uh, a Catholic institution building, if not, not necessarily churches. They could have been the, the, uh, the, the headquarters of the diocese or the uh, convent of the Grey Nuns, um, which is now a Sejep in Montreal, the corner of Atwater and Sherbrooke, mm. uh, or the, um, uh, the Grand Seminary of Montreal, which was sort of diagonally across the street along Sherbrooke Street and ran for blocks. It really was a, it's a massive building. It's now, I think, condos and whatever. But uh, at all over the city, you, used to, you had this kind of thing. So the, the, the if you will, the secular uh, uh, influence of the church was everywhere. And of course, it was it was based on the fact that it was based on Catholicism. Mm. So 
my mother is what I call a card-carrying Catholic. She was somebody who uh, grew up in this environment, and simply that was it was part of her definition of who she was. Uh, she, I don't think she, uh, she, I don't think she questioned too much um, uh, well, her faith uh, or even its practitioners. Uh, when I grew up, um, I did, uh, and I think it's partly my generation that, that the, you know post Second World War uh, baby boomer types. Uh, and later, that we, um, uh, for some reason, for, for some reason or other, I, I don't know why, the growing secularism in the world, maybe uh, two world wars have uh, shaken a lot of people's faith in in the life as it was then led, and people were were finding themselves asking questions. Right. Uh, but uh, I grew up uh, definitely questioning the uh, uh, the Catholic Church and its and its practitioners, and. Yeah. Uh, Calling them out when I thought they were uh, behaving in a way that uh, belied their uh, the words they spoke. You know, their the, the the Bible or the New Testament or the Gospel say one thing, and mm-hmm. I look at you know this so and so and this person who is a prominent Catholic or is a even member of the church is not behaving that way. Right. So there's a gap there, and as uh, I was at the time, I was uh, uh, very very happy to uh, to call them out. Right. And that was a period of political upheaval as well. And there was a lot going on in Montreal at the time as a, in the yes. 50s and 60s, right? Yeah. Right. So yeah. There was, because, yeah. There yeah. was, there was the, you know, the, the, the two solitudes, uh, for, for example, I mean, that really existed in, in Montreal. It didn't really exist, uh, you know, in, in Toronto or Winnipeg right. or Vancouver. People would like, what are you, we need to talk about two solitudes. Uh, right. But in Montreal, English and French lived side by side but ignorant of each other. They didn't speak each other's language. They didn't uh, interact. I mean, they were, we were fine, we were polite with each other, all this kind of thing. We, we were cohesive as a society. A lot of people were, uh, 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 I mean, an enormous number of people were fluently bilingual, uh, but there wasn't a, a lot of uh, back and forth between the Anglos and the, the Francophones. Um, so mm. th- that was something that was going on very much in, in Quebec. We were, everybody was very aware of it. And were you were you anglophone uh, growing up in Quebec, or yes. did you speak? No, I was anglophone. Yeah, okay. I, sp- I spoke a little French, but I was we, I lived Montreal was divided roughly in half. The West End was uh, uh, English, and the uh, the rest of the province really was uh, was francophone. Right, and so so you know, there's this period of time where you're you know in your adolescence you're sort of uh, questioning a lot of the mm-hmm. these institutions, um, and 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 you know, presumably you were sort of looking for your path. Right. Is that fair to say? Yeah, that's And you kind of, yeah, so you found, and you found comedy, like you found comedy. How how did that sort of first start? How did did I get into comedy? Yeah, yeah. Um, Quite by accident. Um, I filled in for somebody in the the show called The the Jazz Society. I, actually, I was, I, I was, the show was, was, had been started in Montreal, came to Toronto. I'd come to Toronto about six months earlier and was working at a photography and uh, audiovisual studio is what it was. And uh, they needed mm. publicity photos, this little troupe. So I took, uh, I volunteered to take their photographs. And I said, let me hang around backstage when I'm done. These are for publicity, you know, headshots and this kind of thing. But I, when it was done, I said, let me hang around backstage and uh, I'll take some more uh, photographs just for my own portfolio and I hung around and I and uh, because people were commuting from Montreal to Toronto at one point a couple of the people decided they didn't want to commute anymore and they were, wanted to leave the show and uh, so uh, uh, I stepped in on a very short notice because they needed somebody literally overnight uh, to to fill in right. and because I'd been hanging around I knew the show and the show I should explain was improvised there were no scripts ever written um, hmm. And uh, so I was asked to fill in for a week until they could find an actor, and I never left. <laughs> they just said, "Yeah, you're. <laughs> we'll just find you." Yeah. Um, and, and yeah. Just, well, I mean, it worked out, I guess. <laughs> I know. So I know. I know my mom was part of the Just Society and uh, yeah. uh, Gig Claim, and that was in the early days. Who was who was sort of there that first cast? What what was that first cast? The first, the very first cast, I forget one of the, one of the names of one of the men mm-hmm. because he didn't, he never came from Montreal to Toronto, but the ones yeah. who did come from Montreal to Toronto, who were, who were commuting back and forth, there was uh, Gay Clayton, your mother, there was mm-hmm. Pat Conlon, <laughs> another fellow, there was Pat, Roger, yeah. Ab- yeah. Roger Abbott, um, John Morgan, 
they later became uh, Air Force. Um, um, oh, Martin Bronstein was another one. Martin, he was initially with Air Force. He was he he and John Morgan were creative partners. Martin uh, was uh, was with Air Force for two years, I think. After it became mm. a radio show, he left. Um, right. I joined them in Toronto before the, before they became, when it was still the Jess Society, and mm -hmm. uh, was around ever since. So so it, it's and 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 as you were kind of doing this, and 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 then when you got onto radio, did you feel like you had kind of a calling here? Like was it or like I'm I'm trying to sort of figure out if it was like you know you know some comedians say well I could never see myself working nine to five I could never have a job I I had, if I wasn't comedy it wasn't going to be anything right and but then there's other people who maybe it's just like yeah I did it and I was good at it and seemed like a good way to make money and thirty years later here I am. you know what I mean like yeah well I I'm kind of trying to understand I'd say I'm in between the two I never felt a real compulsion to do comedy but I always liked hmm. you know I always liked fooling around and kidding around the I I I. I have to say, I n never really saw myself doing a nine to five job. I mean, I tried a couple. I worked hmm. at a couple of places where you were supposed to be in by nine, and th the hard part was getting in by nine. Um, I could never go to bed at night, and I could never get up in the morning. So I had I had a very very uh, unsuccessful uh, record as an employee in a regular, you know, nine to five job. I just. This right. was, I just was not for me. So I always knew I was going to, so, and I think from a fairly young age, I always felt that I was going to be doing something in the arts, and in my case, something to do with language. And of course, when you're writing comedy, language is extremely important because you have to be very, very mm. precise. If you change a few words around, the joke doesn't work. Um, right. So I think every good comedy writer, every good joke writer is a bit of a, a bit of a grammarian. You know, you learn how to what your how grammar works, and where things should be in a sentence. Um, and yeah. the, the, doing the comedy thing because it involved both performing and writing, which was you know, I wasn't I, I never saw myself as an actor. I mean, to me, I, I've always been curious about it, uh, and I've done some. But the, the idea of being a stage actor, where you learn, a, you spend three weeks rehearsing a play or four weeks rehearsing a play, and then you do the, repeat the role every night, or eight, you know, or whatever it is, eight times a week for uh, three weeks or four weeks, that to me would be uh, not too interesting. But uh, Yeah, I can't imagine. I, can't, I, I think about that, I'm like, I, I first of all feel like I don't have the ability to do that. I'm just like, I don't know how people... <laughs> right, right. Well, I think it's... Um, yeah, so you, yeah, so you were always reinventing stuff because you had a show that just always had new sketches, always had new issues to talk That's right. About. We were always remaking the show uh, because of the way the show worked, uh, mm -hmm. you know, by asking audiences at the end of the first half what they wanted to see, and they would tell us, and we'd go up backstage for 20, 25 minutes, and we would uh, come up with new stuff, and that would be the second half. Uh, and eventually, if it, they asked us too often, different audiences did for material that was in the sec. We'd eventually put it in the first half, so they'd stop asking. Uh, but the, sh we, the show continued. Right. <laughs> and what, the other thing that happened, quite by accident, you know, we weren't smart enough to create this ourselves. Is that it, it hung? It, it it continued when we went, got onto radio because it, with with Air Force, because we when a, when a politician was no longer. Or, or any public figure was no longer, uh, you know, prominent. We stopped doing them because audiences weren't interested, and there'd be somebody new come along, then we'd start doing those people. So, in a sense, you know, we didn't have right. characters that uh, had a, you know, a life of like five, six, seven years, and then everybody was tired of them because our 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 cast really was whatever was going on in the world. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. Like I have memory, and I know that you know this was when you transitioned to TV. But I have memories of watching the show, and there were definitely characters that maybe just because they were in politics for so long. But I remember there were characters that you guys did that that mm -hmm. would recur, like you know, John, you know, um, uh, like Roger right. and Cretchen, I think, and you know, um, Luba did. I forget who Luba did, but she had someone who was like. Yeah. Really popular yeah. callback. There was a bunch of people who would like come back over right. and over again. But but the thing is, like when Cretchen left, we stopped doing him. Uh, it used to drive us crazy sometimes when right. they, when they'd get reelected. We'd think, oh gosh, not again. 
<laughs> you <laughs> gotta drag know, this out again. <laughs> we have to keep doing this person. Um, but it was basically what. Yeah. Did you have one that that I wanted or like? Well, did you I, have one I'm, for I'm, you that was? Did you have one that you were that you were doing a lot and you wanted to just kill? You were like, this is enough. Um, yeah, you get tired of them all uh, actually because what happens is like there yeah. were there were uh, five of us in our in, in radio. There were five of us in the cast. It was John. Luba, Roger, me, and Dave Broadfoot, yeah. So, uh, and you can only do, yeah. I don't know how many sketches, maybe seven sketches. We only had 25 minutes. We finished, started after the news and finished 25 minutes later. Right. And so when we would uh, perform, and we did, a, we, we, you know, in radio, we did most of our shows once we got established so that we're on the road. So, you know, when you, when, if you went to, uh, I don't know, whatever, Prince Edward Island or Winnipeg or something, the, the audience would want to see the characters they'd heard on radio. So the writers would always write something, because we had writers at that time as, as well. The writers would say, well, we're going to write a political sketch, and Don is going to play Trudeau, or Joe Clark, or Brian Mulroney. And so quite often, that would be like the only substantial character I'd get to play. And it was like, guys, I'm playing the same character every time we right. go out. It's driving me crazy. <laughs> Other people were having a lot of lot more fun playing, yeah. you know, supporting characters or minor characters or characters that were passing through. But uh, so, you know, you get tired of them all eventually. And But I figured, yeah, it was always a kind of a, I was t always torn between uh, me as a comedian and me as a citizen. Right. Because as a citizen, I may, I may hate a certain politician, but as a comedian, he might be great for laughs, you know, <laughs> right. it's always a bit of a, a conflict, conflict of interest. Right. And, yeah. and so when you were doing this, did you, so you had gone through this period of skepticism, presumably something that continued for a while. What, what, what kept you mm -hmm. motivated? What kept you going? Like what was the sort of larger, um, pa thing that was keeping you, Cause you, cause it wasn't just, you had, you know, this, this show was, is an institution and you guys did it for a long, long time. Um, mm -hmm, so, yes. so what was your kind of internal compass that kept you focused on, on your work? Uh, well, in the early days, it was kind of the excitement of actually having a job. Right. You know, of, of knowing, I mean, seriously, you know, I mean, it sounds, it sounds silly, but, uh, you, the, uh, you know, uh, performing, writing, performing gigs were hard to come by. They were ephemeral. You know, you'd have one for, you'd have a gig for a week or six weeks, and then it would go away, and you'd never get it again. Mm. Um, and I think this offered some continuity, so that was kind of exciting. And, and uh, Roger Abbott and I were creative partners and business partners, and we kind of felt we were building something. So that was another part of the appeal of it. Um, the, but you know, when I when I started doing the the the, the, the comedy, performing and writing, it 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 felt like. I really felt like I was in the right groove or the right slot. It, 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 it worked for my personality mm. because it wasn't just writing and it wasn't just performing. It was both. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, and in a sense, what we, we were able to do is we invented our own work because these, this job, if I can call that, didn't exist before. And uh, you know, we made it up and, uh, the, and we're able to make a living out of it. Yeah. But it really felt, it's, it really felt, you know, uh, um, I mean, years ago, I used to do a fair bit of sailing, and uh, you know, there's a there's a feeling you get when the when the when the, when the sailboat's in the groove or in the slot when you, you know, when you, the winds and the coming from the right place and the, the boat kind of leans over, then is in is tilted to one side and you're in a you're, and it's just moving smoothly through the water. That's you know that's what uh, um, yeah the, my work felt like. I, I remember years ago, I think it was. Leonard Cohen came up with an image for a state of grace being a state of grace was a, a ski with nobody on it, just a ski just on its own going downhill. And it just right. fo followed the landscape very naturally. And that's yeah. kind of what my career felt like. That yeah. it was, I was just doing what I should be doing. Yeah. That's like uh, in music, you call that being in the pocket. You know, yes, if yeah. you're like grooving and everyone is playing music yeah. and you're just locked in, that's that feeling of, Mm -hmm. you're just right you're you're almost like a vessel in a way you know you're yes. you're part yeah. of something and then um you know uh from what i understand of like uh you know zen buddhism or uh, ideas around taoism you know there's kind of the uh the sense of of fo following a natural way like if you find yes. 
the grooves in, you know, they, the, the tale of like the butcher who has the use the same knife for 20 years because he follows the right grooves in the meat or whatever. There's all these sort of apocryphal stories about um, that idea of, of not fighting against it, but finding a sort of a Find, natural harmony or natural way. Yeah, um, finding, finding your place in it. Right, yeah. right. And yeah. you just found that and you felt like this is it. Like this is, yeah. this works for me. I'm in the That's groove right. and yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, it, ne it, it never felt like work. And it, I mean, we worked hard and we knew that, but it never felt like mm. work. And it never felt like a career. It felt more like a life. And um, it always felt like play. Um, and, yeah. you know, for, for me, I've, you know, passed this little bit of wisdom on to many people uh, who are much younger than me, you know, saying that if, mm. if you, if, if you're doing something you love, it's not work, it's play. And if you can't tell the difference between play and work, uh, then you've got it made. If your play mm. is your work and your work is your play, that's pretty terrific. I think the other thing that, um, it's really cool about, uh, air fires and the work you guys did was that you had, you know, you, you know, we, you had the idea of like in the early days, you know, the church was like a, a community center, right? And it provided everything for everyone. Right. And that changed, you know, and government started providing more and people started becoming more maybe independent or skeptical. Um, but, you know, with the with the Air Force, you and, tell, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you had sort of a community. You had, you know, your fellow performers, you had your writers, you had your, your team, your production team, mm -hmm. people you maybe worked for, with for a long time. So even though that wasn't, you know, obviously not like a church, but in a way it was sort of like this place where you could, uh, it, that had just some of the functionality that maybe a church might have served in a community in, a, in, in the earlier days. Yeah, I, I think it's, a, I mean, I, I, would, I hadn't thought of that uh, uh, analogy, before, you know, until you just mentioned it. But I think there is some, some merit in it the, because the, uh, you know, we, had, we were very, it went on radio especially, we were very tight. We were a very small group. The entire production team, including like the producer, the director, the recording ear, the, all that technical stuff, the editor, the writers, the sound effects person, the performers, because we all did multiple things, it was only 10 people. Wow. And uh, 10 or nine people. And um, so there was a lot of overlap. And when we were on the road, we traveled together. And uh, we always, uh, you know, very often um, people nowadays, especially, they expect, well, the, the stars will be you know, up front in the business class and the crew will be in the back. We always traveled all together in the back, hmm. um, partly for economic reasons, partly for, uh, I'm speaking for Roger Abbott and myself, no, partly because it felt like the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, we didn't consider ourselves uh, uh, to be different from them. We were all working together to make the same, make the same show. Um and to, you know, extend your analogy, in a sense, if we were the, the kind of the little church group, the congregation was the listeners. Right. And that's who, uh, in Air Force, from radio and television later, we always uh, held sacrosanct. Is the only reason we're really doing this is for the listeners or, and later the viewers. Uh, we're, not, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're not making comedy that amuses us it does amuse us but that's not why we're making it we're making it because it amuses other people yeah um, and their opinion the opinion of the audience was always the most important opinion that we uh, sought the who's the approval that we sought was from the audience a lot of radio shows at cbc uh, in the early days those early days uh, got their approval from uh, cbc executives who listened to the shows and passed judgment and said, this is good, this is not good, you know, we should do this differently, we should do that differently. Uh, in our case, we had a live audience, and when they laughed, it was very, very hard for uh, an executive of the corporation to come and say, well, that's not funny. Because we, yeah. we would say, well, listen to the friggin' show, Buster. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> right. we, don't use, we don't use laugh tracks. These are no. real... 
real taxpaying Canadians. <laughs> 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 and you know, I, I've been in one of those audiences, so I, I can I can back you up. It's not all a, it's not like the moon landing, you know, it really happened. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, um I'm just kidding. I know the moon landing happened. <laughs> really? Um, I, I think so. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, you know, I think I think it's I think it's kind of the reason I guess I, I make that analogy is because um, I think that we I think fundamentally it's something that is important to us is to find community to find not just our our immediate family or family that we raise but a, but a community um and that could be people on your street it could be the people in a, a house of faith it could be people that you do an activity with or comedy with it could be the people at work but i feel like that that is more important than maybe we give it credit for um yeah, I, and i think we have a culture that tends to be a little more isolationist and 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 but there's a part of it th- us that is looking for that connection, you know, I, you know that you I agree. can't really find online or, yeah. I agree. And, you know, the, much has been written and said about uh, our c- current uh, fascination with individual electronic devices, you know, computers, televisions, yeah. uh, uh, the, the internet, iPhones, all that kind of thing. But... I know that there's you know one very big difference in uh, in uh, all the media consumption if I for lack of I can't that's an ugly phrase but is that I remember when, when years ago certainly when I was growing up when I was very little before that was before television uh, when I was very little we would <laughs> we sat around the radio and listened to the radio listened to uh, serials you know at night uh, half hour uh, serialized uh, uh, radio shows, The Shadow, and you know that kind of thing, um, and then when TV right. came along, we only had one television, a little black and white box with a small screen. Uh, but we all gathered in the uh, in the room where the television was and watched it at night. So there was, uh, you know, my family was quite small. It was just my parents and my brother and I. Uh, other people had mm. bigger families, but they, the same thing, the same rule applied. Everybody sat down around the same thing and watched it. And if I remember going to Europe uh, and, you know, being in small towns and there'd be, there wouldn't be a lot of televisions in the town. There might be a television in the, in the local, uh, you know, bar slash pub slash gathering place. And uh, many, many people would gather at night to watch a TV show. But there'd be like maybe 20 people from the town watching the TV. Uh, but now, you know, you can go into a house with four or five people in it. And they're all watching their own individual things. But there's no sharing of the the, the common uh, program. Right. You know, uh, sis is on the internet right. chatting with her friends. Uh, so is, the, you know, her brother. Uh, maybe dad's on the, the uh, watching TV, watching some sports on TV. Mom is doing something else on, on her own TV. Uh, so, so those opportunities right. for shared experiences, which is... Just, what kind of makes a community or defines what a community is yeah uh, those are, have diminished um, yeah yeah i think so too i think that there's you know some research around that and the around the how social media makes people feel and uh particularly young people yeah. um how it affects their ability to relate um to recognize facial expressions there's all there's all kinds of interesting like impacts mm-hmm. it's having on us and um and and without you know, and I think that that it's really vital to have places people can go to connect on a deeper right. level. Right. You know, that's and and radio. I think podcasts have kind of become like the new the new radio to sign. They're still terrestrial yes. radio. Oh, absolutely. But, you know, I think podcasts allow you to have serialized shows. Yeah, the difference is, is yeah. that, you know, like instead of like your podcast being on at, you know, 8 p.m. on Monday night and people making an appointment to to listen to it, they can listen to it anytime and they can listen to it alone. You know, so the that the, the communal yeah. aspect is there. It's yeah. it's in, it is there, but it's not there in physical fact. Like one of the few places you have that still is you have that in theater, live theater, and you have it when you go to... Um, uh, a movie at a, at a movie theater because you're sitting there with other people in the audience right. and you're all having the same experience at the same time together. Um, 
but you know that's a, a, a rare, a, a more, uh, increasingly a rare uh, experience. Yeah, and I mean the Air Force for a lot of, uh, for for many Canadians was a was a one of those things that it was on at the same time. We watched it, we mm-hmm. talked about it. Um, it, it was consistent, and I think that it became you know part of the cultural fabric. And when I think about sketch now, and there's a lot of really, really good comedy and comedians coming yes. out of, of Canada. I mean, we have, we're in a great time for comedy, I think. Um, yes. Yeah. But at the same time, it tends to be a little bit more fragmented. And the, I think the audience tends to be uh, more niche, um, depending on what's done. Even, I mean, Baroness von Sketch is, is, doing, is doing quite well. But even that show... I think that show 20 years ago, I mean, everyone would watch it. And now it, it has a, a bit more of a niche audience. As yes. good as it is, and I think it's a great show, you know. Right. Um, yes, it's very I, hard very hard to get a, a massive number uh, in terms of ratings anymore. That's why one of the few things that succeed that way, I mean, there are obviously and very clearly hit shows that come yeah. on and do well enough that, the, you know, Game of Thrones or something. but. The other thing that seems to work a lot is uh, work well is live sports, uh, because nobody knows how mm. it's going to end. You, you know, the, you you have to watch it while it's happening, otherwise you've missed the event. And, right. You know, so I think people who watch uh, uh, live sports are aware that they and their their cohorts, whoever they may be, are all doing the same thing at the same time. Uh, because mm. the thing they're watching is only going to happen now. It'll happen, you know, you'll be able to, you know, if it's recorded, you'll be able to get it uh, uh, and in replays or you know, repeats or this sort of thing. But the thrill of yeah. watching it, uh, you know, f- for the first time and uh, live is it only happens once. Yeah, I think so. So I guess my, I have sort of one last question. If that's mm-hmm. all right. Thanks for indulging me. Uh, it's really great to, to talk to you about yeah. this stuff. Um, my, my final question is, um, uh, so where, where are you now? I mean, how do you sort of, and, and, you know, however you want to answer this, but in terms of faith or in terms of, um, you know, where you're looking to the future, like what, what kind of, what does your, does that look like? What does your faith look like? Or what does your, your, what drives you now? Um, that's a good question. I think the. The um, well, yeah, I'm, I'm 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 getting on in years now, as you, uh, I'm sure your your mother would know would attest, uh, since, <laughs> since we're approximately the same age. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thirty six. <laughs> that's <yeah>. right. <laughs> um, <laughs> my um, so I, I you know I I I think more. Uh, I I mean I, I don't think I don't have. A great belief, but I don't think I really even have a belief in an afterlife, uh, mm. and I'm quite content with that. And it's not mm-hmm. because I don't have faith. It, in, a, in a sense, it's because I do. I am very happy to have been given this opportunity at life, and my life is. Is a, has been and continues to be uh, a wonderful thing. It's a marvel to me that mm. it, that we're all alive. You know that we're that there that there is rather than than there is not, um, and it's been. Uh, you know, if I was to die uh, tomorrow, I could I could say that I'm sorry. It's over. I'm going to miss it. It's been a great trip. And thank you for the privilege of having had it. You know, yeah. so I feel I feel yeah. more that way than that. You know, uh, when I close my eyes for the final time, uh, or when I'm blown to bits by a terrorist bomb, that uh, I'm going to uh, uh, reassemble somewhere else and uh, meet my parents again. I mean, I'd love to. But I, I, I think you know what gives life uh, it's it's it, such quality and such depth of uh, of of experience is the fact that there are that you old people go away, people die, friends disappear, but new people come along. It's always changing, and 
You don't get to yeah. see your parents young, but you get to see your children young. Uh, they will never see you young. They will see you old the way you saw your parents old. You know, it's uh, so you you know if you live long enough, you do see old people. You see young people. You see newborns. You see people under deathbed. You see everybody in between. Uh, you see old trees. You see saplings. You know, you see flowers that are uh, budding in the sp that are. You see buds in the spring become flowers in the summer, and the petals fall off in the fall. You see the yeah. whole cycle, and I think that's that whole cycle. Uh, that repeats and repeats and repeats, and you know uh, every flower has its moment, uh, and, and we, we yeah. humans are. I, I take great comfort in thinking that I'm part of that process. Yeah, um, that is beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for listening. You can find our website at faithdeficit.com. Faith Deficits recorded and produced in Guelph, Ontario at Domo Studios. Music by Jeremy Volts. You can hear more of his music at jeremyvolts.com. If you've been enlightened by this week's episode of Faith Deficit, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and provide an iTunes review. You can also support the program on Patreon, and if you do, thanks so much. I'm Josh Bowen, and this is Faith Deficit. <laughs>